Good evening. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our worship tonight as we gather once again uh, to focus on the crucial hours in the life of our Savior, the hours of his suffering and death which brought about our salvation. Uh, so we'll worship tonight according to the order that's printed out in the bulletin. We'll begin with the very first hymn, uh, Lord Support Us All Day Long. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Amen.
may be seated. We'll read responsively the Passion History of our Lord Jesus, Lesson 3. Simon Peter and another disciple kept following Jesus. That disciple was known to the high priest, so he went into the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. But Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and talked to the girl watching the door and brought Peter in. The servants and guards were standing around a fire of coals that they had made because it was cold. While they warmed themselves, Peter was standing with them, warming himself too. One of the servant girls of the high priest came there. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked directly at him and said, You were also with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it in front of everyone, saying, I don't know what you are talking about. Woman, I do not know him. When Peter went out to the entryway, someone else saw him and said to those who were there, This is one of them. This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it with an oath and said, I do not know the man. After a little while, those who stood by came and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, because even your accent gives you away. You are a Galilean. Then he began to curse and to swear. I do not know this man you are talking about. I do not know the man. At that very moment, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the Lord's word, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. He went outside, broke down, and wept bitterly. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in a synagogue or at the temple where all the Jews gather. I said nothing in secret. Why are you questioning me? Ask those who heard what I told them. Look, they know what I said. When he said this, one of the guards standing there hit Jesus in the face. Is that how you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus answered, testify about what was wrong. But if I was right, why did you hit me? The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they could put him to death. They found none, even though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Yet even on this point, their testimony did not agree. The high priest stood up and said to him, Have you no answer? What is this that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I place you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you have said. But I tell you, soon you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? See, you have just heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He is deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him. They covered his face, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? The guards also took him and beat him. 
and they went on saying many other blasphemous things against him. As soon as it was day, the council of the elders of the people met together, both chief priests and experts in the law. They brought Jesus into their Sanhedrin and said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer me or release me. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all said, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, I am what you are saying. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? For we ourselves have heard it from his own mouth. Then the chief priests with the elders They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he felt remorse. He brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders and said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? That's your problem. The chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, It is not lawful to put these into the treasury, since it is blood money. They reached a decision to buy the potter's field with the money as a burial place for foreigners. So that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the thirty pieces of silver, the price the sons of Israel had set for him, and they gave them the potter's field, just as the Lord commanded me. Early in the morning, the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. They did not enter the Praetorium themselves so that they would not become ceremonially unclean. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover meal. So Pilate went out to them and said, what charge do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed over to you. Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said, It is not legal for us to put anyone to death. This happened so that the statement Jesus had spoken indicating what kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. They began to accuse him, saying, We have found this fellow misleading our nation, forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? It is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. When he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Pilate questioned him again. Are you not going to answer anything? See how many charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus still did not answer anything, so Pilate was amazed. Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus. He asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. Jesus answered, I am, as you say, a king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. 
What is truth? Pilate said to him. After he said this, he went out again to the Jews and told them, I find no basis for a charge against him. But they kept insisting, he stirs up the people, teaching all through Judea, beginning from Galilee all the way here. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem during those days. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For a long time he had wanted to see him, because he had heard many things about him. He hoped to see some miracle performed by him. He questioned him with many words, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and experts in the law stood there, vehemently accusing him. Herod, along with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and ridiculed him. Dressing him in bright clothing, Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other on that day. Before this, they had been enemies of each other. And this is God's word. Let's sing together our next hymn, O Perfect Life of Love, hymn number 138. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The section of God's word that we'll give attention to this evening is found in Luke chapter 23, verses 13 through 16. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who is misleading the people. Look, I have examined him in your presence. I have found in this man no basis for the charges you are bringing against him. Herod did not either, for he sent him back to us. See, he has done nothing worthy of death. 
So I will have him flogged and release him. And this is God's word. So it's better than it was. You know, there are some times in my house when uh, my wife and I, uh, we decide that we're going to clean a certain room of the house or maybe a certain multiple rooms of the house. Uh, we do that. We work at it really hard for an hour or so, and then we realize that in our house, it's not just the two of us who live there. There are also four children and a dog. Uh, and so that room that we spent an hour cleaning, sometimes it doesn't take more than five minutes for the dog to come through and leave a plume of dog hair or a child to come through and leave a toy behind. And, and in the end, we just kind of look at each other and, and we say, well, at least it's better than it was. That idea of better than it was is kind of a similar way of describing tonight's theme. Tonight's theme, as you see in your bulletin, is, is a part for the whole. Now, a part for the whole works something like this. It's, it's when a person accepts less than what they really want. Uh, because maybe on one hand, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Or maybe on the other hand, they say, well, something is better than, than nothing or, or it's better than it was. In real life, this is how it might work out. If, if you and a friend go out for a meal and then the time comes for that meal and then the bill comes your way and, and your friend's portion is $17, but they look at you and say, you know, I only have 15. Can you cover the other two? And you say, sure, good enough, no big deal. Uh, on a larger scale, this is what happens when uh, a lending company or, or a bank uh, does a short sale on a home. Uh, because when they look at that house is going into foreclosure, they're looking at repossession and all of those legal costs and headaches. And so what they do is instead of going through all that trouble, they arrange the sale of the house for less than what they really want for it. But they say, well, something for this is better than nothing. Or we might say a, a part for the whole. So we see similar type of logic going on tonight where we find Jesus before Pilate. And so uh, picture the scene there before Pilate. On one side, you have the, the crowds of people, the Jewish leaders who, who brought him to Pilate in order to have him executed. And then you have Pilate who, who had Jesus examined, who did it himself, who examined him and, and found uh, Jesus guilty of no crime that would be worthy of having him executed. And then on top of that, he sent Jesus over to Herod. Uh, and Herod had done the same thing and had concluded the same thing. So now Pilate gathers back together all of those uh, religious leaders to tell them the results of his questioning, the results of his investigation. Now, given that he had found Jesus guilty of no crime, Pilate could have simply just declared Jesus innocent and let him go, sent him on his way, and because he was the Roman governor and they were not, there was really not a single thing that they could have done about it. But because he wanted to make sure that this Jewish problem and this Jesus problem went away, he offered those Jewish leaders something. We could say he offers them a part for the whole, saying that that he'll have Jesus beaten and then released, thinking that, that the Jewish leaders would look at that and say, well, we, we wanted to have this Jesus put to death, but at least he got punished. At least he got beaten, so we'll, we'll give up our case and, and go back home. You see, in all this, Pilate probably convinced himself that, that even though Jesus didn't deserve to be beaten, that even though Jesus was an innocent man, that, that it was actually in some way better to allow an innocent man to be beaten rather than to allow an innocent man to be killed. And in a twisted way, he, he probably thought he was doing a favor or that he was protecting Jesus by only having him beaten instead of allowing these men who wanted to kill him to, to kill him. But here's what happened with that offer. Just those Jewish leaders, they rejected it. For them, something was not better than nothing. Having Jesus beaten was not as good as seeing him executed. And, and their desire to be rid of Jesus once and for all, they would be satisfied by, by only one thing, and that was Jesus' death. And there were no half measures or anything else that would do. And if you think about it, isn't that often how it works when a person rejects Jesus? It's, it's not just enough to say, you know what, I, 
I don't need to have Jesus in my life, or I don't need to listen to his word or anything like that. But how how often does it happen that that when a person rejects Jesus, they tend to want Jesus and anything that will remind them of Jesus completely removed from their life so that they don't have to think about Jesus or hear about Jesus or or see any reminders of him again. And so those Jewish leaders, in their intense desire to get rid of Jesus, they they latch on to something that, that he had said before Pilate, that he had admitted before Pilate, and that's that he was a king. And then they insisted that anyone who who claimed, who admitted to be a king, well, that person can be no friend of the emperor. This was their way of of telling Pilate that uh, if if you let this Jesus go, we will kindly or not so kindly remind your, your supervisor, the emperor, that you did not take seriously this treasonous threat to the throne. So for those Jewish leaders, there would be no something is better than nothing. For them, there would be no part from the whole. They wanted to see Jesus dead. Now, when we think of our lives today as God's people and the lives that we live, you know, surrounded by the temptations that the world puts in front of us or or the temptations that the devil just lobs our way, are there ever times when we operate in terms of part for the whole? I mean, think about it. Are there times when we perhaps give in to temptation partially, thinking that, well, we can still have the little bit of pleasure that comes with the sin, but without having the whole sin itself and all the other destruction that comes along with the sin? Maybe as an example of that, think of this. Imagine a person who who is faced with a strong temptation to break the sixth commandment, a strong temptation to engage in sexual relations with somebody who is not his or her spouse, But instead of doing that, he says, or she says, well, I'm just going to look at this magazine, going to look at this pornography, thinking that, all right, well, I'll get the pleasure of looking without the destructive sin of actually doing. There's two flaws with that line of thinking. First one is, no matter what form it takes, sin is always sin, whether that sin comes in our thoughts in our words or in our actions. And so then whether it is by looking, whether it's by thinking, or whether it's by action, sin always harms our relationship to God. And sin always brings damage and destruction into our lives, even though we may not always see it right away. But then secondly, the devil in his temptation, he never only settles for partial sin when it comes to tempting us. No, if we open the door a little bit, he wants to kick that door open all the way. He wants to take every little sin that we give into and use it as opportunity to lead us into great and grievous and shameful sins because that is, after all, what his aim is, to lead us deeper and deeper into sin and to destruction. I mean, do you remember how the Apostle Peter described him in his letter as as a roaring lion who looks for somebody to devour? But also remember when we think that way with temptation, if we treat our temptation in, in the world of part for the whole, give into a little bit, um, think about how we're also at the same time doing a similar thing when it comes to our relationship to God and obedience to Him. When we treat temptation as something that we can give into partially, we're also saying to God, Well, God, I, I know that you you call me as your child to a life of complete obedience, but God, how about how about I give you 70% obedience and we call it good because God, you know, you know, something is better than nothing, right? Think for a moment about how insulting that is to God. Maybe to help us understand just how insulting it is to God, uh, think of it this way. Uh, who of you would promise to be faithful to your spouse for 360 days a year? 360 days. That's a pretty substantial part for the whole, is it? But how many days are in a year? <laughs> 365. Um, I'm not just saying this because my wife is here tonight, but I would not expect her to agree to my faithfulness for 360 days a year rather than 365 and a quarter. So we should expect God to be thrilled with our partial obedience to him either. Now, God doesn't say, be perfect, but I'll take the best that you got. He doesn't say, love the Lord your God with some of your heart or most of your strength and most of your mind and, and love your neighbor as yourself when it works for you or when it's convenient or any of that. And yet that's so often how we treat it, isn't it? We act like God should be pleased with our 
something's better than nothing attitude towards his word, something's better than nothing attitude towards his will, like, like he should be happy when we offer him token obedience, like, like we should be praised for, you know, for doing the outward action, but completely ignoring the attitude of the heart that God really wants. But the Bible's clear. When it comes to obedience, it's, it's all or nothing. As the Apostle James said, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And that's why Jesus regularly called out the Pharisees for their disobedience. Not their outward disobedience, but it was that their obedience did not come from the heart. So during this Lent season, as we consider our Savior's suffering and death, I invite you to consider with me the various times and the various ways that you have offered to God only partial obedience, only partial love, only partial service. To think about those things and then to simply confess. Confess those sins to him. It doesn't have to be anything flowery or fancy. It can simply just be something like this. Lord, I confess that I have not always loved you with all my heart. I have not always strove to give you total obedience from the heart. And then maybe list off some ways that you identified in your life that you've done that. Admit your sin to him. Don't just stop there. Admit that sin and then look once again at Jesus. And thank God. Thank God that when Jesus came to rescue uh, us, to rescue you and me from sin, that Jesus did not offer us a part for the whole, but rather Jesus offered his whole self to that task. When it came to the perfect obedience, Jesus didn't say, you know, Father, how about, how about I keep seven of the Ten Commandments and, and let's leave them responsible for the other three? Nor did he say, how about I keep all the commandments but 70% of the time and, and they got to keep it 30% of the time, you know, make up the difference. No, no, Jesus didn't say that. Instead, he said, I'm going to keep all of the commandments and I'm going to keep all of the commandments perfectly. I'm going to keep all those commandments perfectly from the heart and I'm going to keep all those commandments perfectly from the heart all the time so that I can offer to God perfect obedience on behalf of every human being uh, who ever lived. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Look at his life, that beautiful life, how every moment of every day of his life, he loved his heavenly father with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and how he loved his neighbor as himself. He did all of that for you. He lived in perfect obedience. And the same is true when it came to his death for our sins. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he didn't agree on that cross to just take condemnation for for 70%, 80%, 90%, even 99% uh, of our sin and, and to leave us to have to suffer for the rest. No, Jesus took it all. He drank that cup of suffering down to the very last drop. He took every last bit of of God's wrath and punishment that our sin deserved, every last bit of separation from God that our sins had earned us, every last bit of death, both physically, spiritually, and, and eternally. And only when all of that was truly done did Jesus say it's finished. Because it was. It was truly done. He paid for all of our sins. The whole lot of them, every last one of them, with his innocent suffering and death. And so knowing that Jesus gave not just part of himself, but his whole self, that he gave his whole self for us to rescue us from sin, now we can live our lives today as his people certain of his forgiveness, certain of his love, and confident that God does, in fact, accept us as his people, and he'll never turn us away. And when we're certain of that, it has the power to change something in you and in me. See, when we look at Jesus and how he gave his whole self to serve and to save us, then we no longer want to give God just part of our lives, and we no longer want to give him just some token obedience. But when we see how Jesus gave everything for us, then we want to give him everything. We want to give him our our work weeks, our marriages, our thoughts, our weekends. We want all of those things, our whole lives, to belong to him. Not just part, but the whole. See, we surrender all to him 
because he's the one who surrendered all for us. See, Pilate offered those Jews a part for the whole, but Jesus gave his whole self for us. So remembering all that he gave for us and the forgiveness that it won for us, let's strive to do the same for him out of love and thanks. Amen. Please stand. So now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, uh, that peace will guard and keep your hearts and minds in true faith in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Please stand for prayer. Abide with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us in the evening of the day, in the evening of life, in the evening of the world. Abide with us in your grace and goodness, in your holy word and sacrament, in your comfort and blessing. Abide with us when we are overcome by the night of sorrow and fear, by the night of doubt and affliction, by the night of bitter death. Abide with us and with all your people in time and in eternity. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen. We'll sing together our closing hymn. You may be seated.
Good evening again. Uh, glad to get to be here. I don't know if you say good evening after church or not. I, I say it all the time, and whether or not people answer me, it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, glad to get to be here tonight to share God's word with you uh, once again this Lent season. Uh, name is Corey Van Campen, serving at St. Paul uh, in Toma. I um, actually have my wife and two of my kids, who you heard a little bit about in the sermon tonight. Um, not that they would ever leave a toy anywhere that they're not supposed to. Not that their cheeks are turning red right now at all. Um, but, uh, but they are here tonight, so that's my wife, Mandy, and two of my girls, uh, Addie and Greta. Um, so they haven't been here with me before. Maybe they were here once. Um, so anyways, that's who they are, if you're wondering. Um, but yeah, serving there, uh, privileged to serve before that in Flagstaff, Arizona, before that in Kennewick, Washington. Uh, if that sounds familiar, it's the same place where Pastor Baerbach had served. I'm not going to say how many years prior to me he served there. Um, but let's just say it was more than two uh, and, and leave it at that. Um, but very great to see you all again. And uh, God's blessings to you and your ministry here in Black River Falls. And look forward to coming back here again in about a year. Thank mm -hmm. you. 